Hello there. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Robert, and uh, I'm the check manager for this uh, for this session. The session that we're going to be uh, enjoying today is uh, "Beg, Borrow, and Steal: uh, Grow in a Security Program from One to N." The um, the 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 speaker is going to be David Gilman. He's a senior security engineer at a rapidly growing startup focused on application and cloud security. Previous roles include in building a security program from the ground up and working at a satellite communications company. Previously worked in uh, product management. He got d d degrees from Texas A&M and soon to be uh, Georgia Tech. So without further ado, I'll uh, pass this over to, to David. Awesome, thank you so much for the introduction. Let me go ahead and share my presentation. Great, it looks like, great. So thank you to everyone who's uh, choosing to attend my talk on this Saturday. Um, to give another bit of introduction, uh, my name is David Gilman. I'm currently a senior security engineer at MParticle. Uh, we are the aforementioned rapidly growing customer data platform startup. I also work at Favorite Delivery, who's owned by ACB. Since this is San Antonio, I'm, I'm sure some of y'all are familiar with that acquisition and maybe even we talked paths previously. And before that, I had a security role at a, a customer data platform called, or sorry, just another uh, company called Biaset, that's the satellite company that was mentioned. Um, and then I have a degree from Texas A&M and finishing up my master's online at Georgia Tech. You can find me on Twitter at Prime Mover and in a frequently updated Twitter account um, for any questions, or if you want to reach out and network after or on LinkedIn or elsewhere, I'd love to chat. So a few disclaimers given the nature and the uh, provocative title of my talk. First of all, don't actually like cheat or steal. Um, I think it's important to, you know, in the workplace, I'm certainly not endorsing being a sociopath or Machiavellian in your approach to workplace politics. I definitely advocate for a collaborative approach over anything else. And of course, these are my own views. They don't necessarily represent my employer, my boss, or any of the companies that I've worked at in the past. So a little bit of an overview. I would like to just talk about what we'll be talking about, um, as well as each of the categories of my talk. Uh, this, I think, presentation is most relevant for those of you who work at software startups or small and growing businesses in the B2B or B2C space. Uh, I think it also could be relevant for like SMBs where maybe the security program is becoming modernized uh, as of course software is eating everything. So more specifically, what I wanted to discuss today is obviously growing your security program at a startup. So today your security program uh, is, is small, maybe non-existent, uh, but you want it to grow. And so I'm trying to answer that question of how you, can you go about that effectively? And who might you be in this, this situation? So you might be the first or only security engineer at a startup. Uh, you might have a title like security manager or CISO, but you have a small or non-existent team. Or you might be someone who would like to do any of these things. I actually sort of got my start on this journey that I'll be talking about today. When I was attending LASCON, I watched an awesome talk by a gentleman named Leaf uh, about being the first security engineer. And later that day, I got a call offering me a job to do just that. So maybe you'll have a similar experience <laughs> uh, taking the lessons learned from this and getting to apply them in your own journey. Uh, so welcome to security at a startup. Um, you're probably already familiar with this, but it, you'll start out you know, implementing some policies and procedures, fix some glaring security uh, issues, and if you or a B2B startup, then you're probably responding to endless customer security questionnaires that no one will actually ever read. 
if this is where you're currently at or you're just looking for some other resources, here are a few. So there's that aforementioned Lascon talk by Leaf. I found this to be a really good touchstone when I was first getting started um, as like a security team of one. And he has a lot of great resources in the slides. Uh, there's a company called Screen that has RASP and WAF products. Uh, they were recently acquired and their website's now become just a big announcement of their acquisition. But I found that their uh, marketing materials essentially were really, really useful. So they published these checklists, um, SaaS CTO security checklist, CISO security checklist, first 90 days as a security engineer checklist. Um, they're kind of hard to find now, maybe archive.org, but this is a link I found to one of them that have been archived. I found these really useful. Also, if you're unfamiliar, Latacora is a company that specializes in consulting um, for security for startups. And so their blog is really well written and has a lot of great articles. I've seen um, them reference quite a bit and I've referenced them myself. So let's say you've, you've had this role for about a year. Uh, you've impressed your boss with your security knowledge. You taught employees not to respond to emails from the CEO asking for Walmart gift cards. And hopefully the engineering team doesn't hate you. Well, what now? So probably thinking about growth at this stage. Uh, why grow at all? Uh, I think it's important to consider, do you actually need to grow? I wouldn't advocate growing for growth's sake. Um, but there's a few categories I think would, a few different reasons why you might have legitimate reason to need to grow a security team. So the first of all, first of all is if you're in security engineering, cloud security engineering, uh, would be to support a growing engineering team. It's gonna be more code review, uh, more code to review. There's going to be more need for automation to support that growth efficiently. You might also, in a B2B company, have sales growth. So there's more fun RFP Excel sheets to fill out. Uh, there's more sales calls to sit in on. And there's just more volume of day-to-day -day work. And then also missing expertise. So as we all know, some job description writers might not, but as we all know, there's no such thing as a unicorn security engineer, security professional. And I guarantee whatever experience you have, there's something missing or something you're not as strong in. So bringing in that extra uh, expertise could be really, really valuable, especially if there's literally only one of you. So what are some challenges to growth and why might you be attending a talk like this to learn more about it? Well, of course, budget is always finite. Um, and at most businesses, security costs money, doesn't make money. You'll know if you're an exception to this, a uh, security consulting business, for example, of some kind or a security vendor. But at almost all of our employers, we are costing the company money to employ us. Um, there's also almost always more exciting things for leadership to invest in. Sometimes there's exceptions to this. If uh, a CTO has some background in security and they really pride themselves on taking it seriously, or maybe they live through a company or career ending incident, but generally speaking, it's much more interesting for them to invest in new features, a bigger sales team, uh, a cool new office. And also, this is a hard truth, but in almost all cases, security incidents are not company ending. Uh, we can all think of dozens of incidents, high profile ones, many of which were arguably due to negligence, under investment by leadership in security. And yet those companies are, many of them, most of them are still uh, have gone on to IPO, have high market capitalizations, continue to do business. So understanding the prioritization of security, it's important to put that in context. Uh, and also, if you're doing your job well, or you're just lucky, then from leadership's perspective, there might be no indication that you need more money. Um, it, it's kind of a hard truth, but security, there's obviously a certain randomness aspect to it. And so if you just haven't had to deal with an incident then, or you've dealt with incidents well, then from leadership's perspective, you know, we're handling things great. There's no issue. So how to grow? I would say, you know, just ask for more money. It's that simple. Thank you for coming to my talk. All right. Well, if that approach has not solved your problem in the past, then I'm hoping to give you some more actionable ways to approach this problem. And I've broken them down with a pithy title, begging, borrowing, and stealing. So, and I would describe these categories as begging is basically how to ask your boss better. Borrowing is finding partners in your organization. 
and stealing is finding ethical and legal ways to save money and headcount. So begging, this is usually the first and last step for security engineers, much like my gift from earlier, asking for money, please. Uh, you might ask your boss for a big pen test budget or that six figure Splunk license that you really want. Uh, they agree, they take it to the annual budget meeting and they come back empty handed. You know, this year it's just, um, you know, maybe 2020 was a rough year, maybe 2020 was a great year. Either way, there's money that needs to be invested in other things. Uh, there's bigger fish to fry. AWS costs are always going up. Got to get those margins down, margins up. So how can we as security professionals address this in a way that will actually get the business to listen to us? Is another one of those sort of hard truths, but securities don't exist just to have good security. Companies exist, generally speaking, to make money. Uh, and if you think that security is important, you need to articulate why in a dollar and cents way. To do that, you need to understand how the business thinks about money and how it goes about spending it. So why might a company spend money on security? Uh, here's a few reasons. You may be familiar with some of these already, but maintaining voluntary compliance like SOC 2 lands customers. Uh, obviously, some of these are more B2B or some more B2C. Customers might also leave after a public incident. I think this is true of both B2B and B2C. Bad press is, is bad in both cases. Um, bad press, if you're a private company or a public company, can scare away investors. Violating GDPR or other privacy laws can lead to loss of access to markets or fines. And on the flip side, perceived or actually good security can lead to more customers. Uh, that I think is an under, in sensitive industries, this is more like a well-realized, but it can be true in a lot of different industries. And that's why you see all those marketing things about bank grade encryption or military grade encryption, because there's at least someone on the marketing team thinks that saying those sort of things is going to get more customers. Uh, this can all, on the other, on the other side, is sort of the way that security might negatively impact the company. Uh, you could look at things like credential stuffing, where even if there's not technically a weakness in your security, if someone picks up a news story from social media about how your company got hacked, that can also lead to customer churn and negative press. And you might think these matter more for B2B, but I, I also really think they matter for B2C, especially if you're in a sense of industry, finance, data of some kind, healthcare. Okay, so I wanna give a little bit of, of risk 101. If risk is your day job or you have some really strong background in this, I wanna just emphasize that this is 101. Um, if you wanna nitpick, nitpick my definitions of risk and things like that, I'm happy to take comments and questions, but even this basic understanding really helped me. So risk in some definitions or risk exposure can be represented by the likelihood of a given event in a year multiplied by the estimated cost to the business. So for a ransomware attack, you might say, I think it'll be a ransomware attack on our company successfully every 10 years. And we'll have to pay a $4.4 million ransom in Bitcoin. So that works out to $440,000 annualized risk. Um, also, if you're not a pipeline company, then the FBI probably is not gonna get your Bitcoin back. Uh, and then maybe the cost will be higher. It's also useful when you're looking at these numbers, how you come up with those costs. So a Bitcoin ransom number pulled pull from the headlines is easy. Uh, it's also useful to add on to those when it comes to customer churn that you're estimating, so loss of revenue, as well as uh, person hours. So engineering resources and security resources are quite expensive. Pulling 10 people to work on like an incident or a potential breach really adds up quickly in terms of opportunity cost for the company, and you can represent that here. Uh, you can also talk to engineering, leadership, legal, and other departments and ask them to come up with numbers because for one thing, they might be more accurate, and for another, they're more likely to trust their own numbers instead of you bringing them to, to them. I think it can be useful to help them come to grips with this idea, and, and I've had a great deal of success with that. Uh, just by being one of the first people in a startup to really talk about risk. It can also be useful to try to measure these numbers over time and, and say a graph or think of them like a KPI unto themselves. A warning though, 
even though you sort of are making up numbers, don't just make them up out of thin air. And also be clear that these are estimates. The people you're presenting them to are going to realize that. And so if you try to present these as some sort of fixed gospel, it's not going to go over well. So a little bit more about annualized risk. Uh, so we talked about this Bitcoin example where we've calculated our $440,000 uh, annualized risk. You can also express this, of course, um, monthly or in a decade format. But look at how we can tie spend or budget items to this risk. So suddenly spending, let's say, 20 k a year on AV licenses for our endpoints, that looks much more reasonable especially if you look at it as only $1.7,000 cost per month. Uh, this is a really great way to present these. And again, that's why it's risky to just make up numbers. You, it'd be unethical and it would fall apart quickly to do so. But if you have annualized risk numbers that are coming from leadership that they agree with, then when you put spend in this context, it really shows why simple investments make sense. And I wanted to emphasize again that even though this is probably very basic to some of you, uh, this level of risk assessment can be game changing at a startup. People don't like things, uh, scary things like cybersecurity or getting hacked, and they don't like spending money. So asking them to spend money on cybersecurity is a double whammy. Um, so even just having estimated numbers in an Excel spreadsheet can really uh, bring a new level of a new way for them to think about this and they can start thinking about risks and cybersecurity in the context of how can I actually fix this and prevent it, not just, oh, it's a scary thing that I don't want to think about. So talking a little bit more about risk, I think we're all aware of this, but perfect security is infinitely expensive. Uh, here's a quote that I'm sure many of you are familiar with that I particularly love, but the idea is basically there is no way to secure uh, to properly secure a computer system without maybe dumping it into the ocean. Even then, maybe not. And of course, it won't be available then. So you violated the CIA triad anyway. So all this to say, some risk is always going to have to be accepted. Uh, it's better to have conversations with your leadership about how to handle these risks um, and thinking about thinking about them in context of avoiding, transferring, mitigating, or accepting. Uh, is also great because, again, there's always going to be risk that is accepted or avoided. And additionally, you're not always preventing risks, right? We're mitigating them. This is a book that I found very useful. Uh, it gives a few ways to think about risk in a more advanced way than simply multiplying some numbers, um, more about statistics, probability, and sort of modeling. Of course, if you're going to use something like this, you'll have to be able to explain it to whoever's reading it. Um, they probably won't just take your word for it. But again, I found it very useful. Risk is its own industry. And so there's lots of great resources as well online uh, via podcasts and blog posts. So this is tangentially related to risk, but it can sometimes be worth it to spend money to spend more money. Uh, Having a cybersecurity risk assessment conducted by a third party, if you can get the budget for that, can give you the justification you need for security investment. In a lot of cases, unfortunately, uh, leadership might not trust your judgment that there needs to be further investment, but getting a small investment in a consulting gig could show that uh, there, there are gaps that need to be met or that you're not meeting benchmarks by your peers. And these sort of assessments are often offered by firms that also do pen testing or security channel sales. I was talking to a pen tester, a former pen tester coworker of mine, and, and he confirmed this. He said it was ironic, but uh, having to spend money justify spending more money with that same company doesn't really make sense from our perspective, but it can for some reason make sense from business's perspective, and therefore it can be really valuable. Okay, so moving on to another subject of KPIs. Um, I wanted to talk first about company KPIs. So what uh, KPIs or metrics does your company care about? And you can determine this if you don't know already by looking at signs around you. What kind of numbers or percentages go into a bonus structure or promotion ladder? In sales, this is very obvious. Usually it's things like deals closed, um, average size of deal, 
month or quarterly revenue targets, annual revenue targets, growth. I also find it really useful to look at what gets talked about at every all hands or town hall. Uh, these are also often metrics around growth, but they could be around other items as well. And to be clear, I'm not talking here necessarily about security KPIs, but I will be uh, talking about those specifically in a second. So here are a few KPIs that can impact security for good or for ill. Um, things like churn rate, cost to acquire a customer, how many monthly active users we have, customer net promoter score, the annual revenue of the company or the defect escape, escape rate. There's obviously more to this, but these are ones that aren't necessarily tied to security, but again, security can have a good or a bad impact on. At Favor, an example was customer churn. We theorized that if there was a security incident of some kind, or even just that example I gave earlier of reporting on, say, account takeovers, something that wasn't necessarily a security uh, vulnerability, but some sort of deficit that we weren't accounting for, or that our customers weren't accounting for by reusing their passwords, uh, our churn could increase. So customers might see that their favorite delivery app, again, doesn't actually have issues like this, but if the perception of that could lead to uh, them choosing to order from a competitor. And I think this is true in most industries where there's a clear peer, which is true for a lot of startups. Uh, and then that would impact one or more of these KPIs, which could decrease our ability to grow. So how can you impact these KPIs? Um, in a good way, you can implement security sensitive features or help engineering do it. To use the... Um, to use the account takeover example for B2C, so you could calculate the cost of not addressing an issue. For ATOs, you calculate the number of support hours spent on an ATO times the number of ATOs or account takeovers times how much the, uh, the business values their time, which is probably some uh, standard hourly wage with some percentage of overhead. This should be relatively easy to track down um, if you have a mandate to create things like risk documents. But Calculating that, it can quickly add up. And so there's you then have in hand that annualized risk, which may even be getting realized in an actual annual spend. Uh, and you can then uh, calculate how much it might cost to fix it. So one way to fix it could be those security features, maybe implementing a form of MFA, password meter, these different approaches that you might use to drive down account takeovers therefore it could drive down the spend on this inside the company. And then that's the kind of win that you can talk about at an annual review of the team's performance, your promotion cycle, or put on a resume. So those are hard numbers. Uh, also on the B2B side, you can proactively, security can help proactively drive these KPIs by creating security materials to help close sales leads. There's uh, obviously a huge appetite depending on the industry, but those endless security RFPs, we've probably all been on both sides of them. And responding with a solid white paper with technical details can help show that your security team does have a handle on things right off the bat. Also can make filling out those customer questionnaires easier. Another thing for B2B in particular is tracking if there are prospects or customers who've been requesting security features. This should be probably tracked by product in an issue tracker, but you should also be your own PM in a lot of these cases. Talk to people inside the company, talk to support, talk to sales, find out what kind of security features there's appetite for that haven't been implemented. And then here's some security incidents, or sorry, some metrics that your boss might care about. So a number of incidents per year, a um, number of pages you're getting after business hours, and show them that to show why you might quit if you don't grow the security team. Uh, account takeovers in a year. And then also a great one's percentage of vulnerabilities passed within your existing bug SLA. If you don't have a bug SLA, that'd be a great project too. Uh, number of incidents also can show poor security or just poor ability to detect issues. If you have a very low number of incidents, then you probably don't have enough detection in place. Uh, I've been talking about ATOs a lot, but to me, it's a good example, and driving down those numbers was a huge win for me and the team. And for both a B2B and B2C, 
uh, looking at what vulnerabilities were discovered at what point in the process is really valuable. So that goes with that whole pushing left mantra uh, and automation, sec DevOps, those sort of buzzwords. But it, we're probably all familiar with the idea that the earlier you fix vulnerabilities and catch them in the process, the cheaper it is and the better it is for security because you don't want critical vulnerability to be released into prod. It'd be much cheaper to prevent that critical vulnerability by catching it on a developer's workstation before they even commit the code. And trying to measure that both for bugs and for vulnerabilities, which you can think of like a subset of bugs, uh, is, is important to measure. So moving on to budgeting, the, it's important to understand how your company and organization handle budgeting before you can effectively ask for things, or at least move beyond the ad hoc way of just saying, hi, can I have 20K for this? Hey, can we spend 100K on pen testing this year? Uh, so <clears throat> some things to figure out about how budgeting works at your company is, how does the calendar year look like? Is the fiscal year tied to the calendar year? Uh, is the budget broken up into a first and second half? Are there discretionary funds? Can you get approval for some items just by going to your boss? Or is there certain cutoffs where they'll need their boss or the CFO to sign off on? Security should probably be involved in the purchasing process, but if you're not already familiar with it, understanding how that looks, you're gonna have to get privacy and legal to sign off on it. How can you make that easier and prevent it from getting slowed down? Benchmarking, I talked about this a little bit earlier with the idea of benchmarking against your peers with a third party. I also find benchmarking to be a bit of a black art. I'll talk about some numbers I found for startups in let's say 100 to 500 plus employee range, but it's a bit of a black art. And so if you have any great numbers on benchmarking, please let me know. I've had the best luck through reaching out to peers or literal competitors, finding out how their security teams grow at different stages. Uh, but this is my crude diagram using basically Microsoft Paint and Comic Sans to illustrate a principle that I found useful and that if you can explain this well to your leadership, this can be really powerful. The idea is that as a total headcount or the engineering headcount of an organization grows, the security headcount will need to grow along with it. So, you know, at 10 employees, there probably wasn't a need for a security engineer. Maybe somewhere around the uh, 100 employee mark, they invested in you, they, the prototypical first security engineer hire. Um, then at some later point, you're now asking to grow and add on to grow the team to more than just one. Uh, this, of course, starts to beg the question in your boss's mind of, well, how much are we gonna have to grow? How many security engineers are gonna be running around here? And the good news for, for them is that, in my experience, you don't need to grow the team linearly. You don't need one security engineer um, for every like 50 engineers forever. What you can do is once you reach this tipping point where one person isn't cutting it, scale the team, during that period of growth, some big fundraise or other natural period of growth, up to maybe like some, some one manager size team, or as Amazon would say, like a two beats of team or less. Uh, and that will give you the foundation to build out things like automation and have broad expertise. And you can grow much more slowly after you sort of reach that foundational point. Um, and again, communicating this to your boss will help can, could help convince them to invest in the security team with the idea that, oh, this is like, this is an investment we're gonna make, a commitment to security, but this should give us a good foundation and we won't have to just keep growing at this rate. These are just some ratios I've seen. Um, again, if you have great numbers on this, please let me know. It goes without saying, but this can vary so much. Uh, if you are a security sensitive company and not security sensitive company, if the CTO used to be a CISO, if the uh, CTO hates security because one time they blocked him from releasing a product, those can all influence how much the business is willing to invest. Um, benchmarking can be useful though, if you can get numbers from peers or competitors, you can engender some of that FOMO in leadership and say, oh, well, our security team is one tenth the size of our competitor, even though our revenue is pretty similar. And they're gonna start thinking, well, what do they know that we don't? Uh, they, we, they don't want to be the ones in the, in the news for breach while the competitor gets to tout their excellent security program. 
So to tie together some of these themes, um, you want to tie specific risks and asks together. Uh, as I've kind of illustrated below here in a very crude budget template, budget request template, uh, this is a, a way you might go about that. If there already is a budget or risk template, use that at your company. You want to speak the language. And yes, this is primitive. Please do better. But it's, it's infinitely better than asking for budget piecemeal. Um, some things that, if you've only worked at bigger companies, might seem like table stakes are can be potentially like game changing at a startup because because no one's ever done them before. Also, a tip: don't just request what you think you can get. Uh, request what you actually need and let the business decide what risk they want to accept. This is a don't pad your budget, but uh, ask for anything reasonable. You can add prioritization to that possibly as well, like a high, medium, low. Obviously, it's, it's less likely that your lows are going to get accepted, but it helps just from a psychological negotiation perspective sometimes to phrase things like that. And of course, the benchmarking can potentially be helpful as well. All right, so moving on to borrowing, which is a topic that is a little bit more broad, I think, than the ones I put under begging. Here's, here's a few items, though, that I think fall into this category. So first of all, security champions. This is a concept that uh, where designated engineers or other employees take the lead on security issues. This could include weekly or monthly syncs with the security team. Um, and it can be a good way to get information on what's going on in the company, as well as to disseminate more information on maybe a new process or a category of loan that you're seeing. This is purely my personal opinion, but I'm not a huge fan of security champions. Uh, maybe it's the problem is me, but I've had trouble making it worth the time of engineers. Uh, they often have plenty to do already. So adding one more meeting on their calendar can kind of just be a pain in the ass, even if you're giving them free stickers or t-shirts, uh, and even if they attend and are interested. What I've had more luck with is what I'm calling security champions, in quotes. If you've been doing security at a startup or you've joined a company early in its security uh, team's growth, then you're already familiar with the idea that someone's already been doing security. So that might be uh, QA doing some ad hoc pen testing or engineers who have been having to implement authentication and authorization or support doing fraud prevention. If you talk to them, which you should have already done if you've been at the company a year in this example, uh, you can also kind of get an assessment of whether they want to keep doing more security. And with that communication, you can find out from them if there's possible security issues in the future, as well as what kind of skeletons are in the closet. Uh, there, You can find allies in this all over the company. And I've had success in areas as diverse, lots of in, in engineering, of course, but also even in legal and support, where legal would end up actually looping me in on risk issues, just because there really wasn't anyone else in the company thinking about risk. And so when they saw issues that were even only security adjacent, I'd get a heads up and could help give feedback and input. And so there wasn't a meeting that we attended other than maybe a monthly sync, but it was just the two of us, like a one-on-one. -on -one. But um, even then, it was still very valuable. Caveat, though, don't get in trouble um, by getting someone to do security work instead of their own work. You don't want to just be dragging people away from their responsibilities. OK, so this is another one that I'll give some caveat at the end, but sharing job recs or job postings. Here's a possible example. Maybe your operations or DevOps team needs more headcount. Uh, maybe you need someone to do cloud security work or network security work or uh, just do that sort of work for the security team because there's not enough capacity. Uh, it can be possible to combine job postings to get more efficient use of headcount. This can look like they already have a couple recs open and you talk to them about some sort of compromise where you use one of those recs for this purpose, but they still report into ops. Or maybe they actually end up reporting into security. Um, but you agree with security with, with ops that maybe your team will take on some of those security tickets and responsibilities that have been on their plate. Um, it can also be going to leadership together and saying, hi, we're trying to make efficient use of budget so if we'd like to come, instead of asking for two jobs, uh, we're going to be asking for one. 
Again, though, this can be tricky because it could backfire in some organizational politics way. And it could be tricky for the person being hired into the role where they might get pulled thin, being expected to do two jobs. So uh, I'm, it, it can go wrong, but I would say that if you're careful with it, it can also be used to your advantage. Also, interns, I put them in this category because you're sort of borrowing them from school. And I also want to note, you should pay your interns. It's really never any excuse not to in our industry or really any industry. Uh, so I'm not saying get free labor from interns, but they can be very helpful. This is also potentially tricky if you've ever worked with interns. Even a senior engineer, it's kind of expected that I'll take them at least 90 days to be fully productive and functional or longer. And an intern's only gonna be there for 90 days in most cases. So it's a lot to expect someone in undergrad or graduate school to be productive more quickly than like a senior engineer. But if you scope the projects really well, or you have a single well-scoped project, and even better, if you can pick a project from your backlog that fits their interest and skill set by talking to them before the summer or their intern period starts, then they may be able to accomplish quite a bit. Uh, also, I'd say in having interns is very fun and rewarding. So I'm always an advocate for that, giving back and getting to um, play like a mentorship role. So an example of this for me was that we brought on an intern kind of unexpectedly, and she actually completely knocked it out of the park. Part of that was the planning uh, that went ahead of time. I'd attribute most of it to like her work ethic and intelligence, but um, part of it was that we picked a good project. So we presented her with a list of things she might be interested in working on. She picked one that she thought would, would be interesting. And then over the course of summer, the summer finished it. Um, it was a complete success. It's now part of our product that customers see pretty much every time they use the app. And a little bit more about budgets. So budgets can be sort of borrowed or shared. Um, there might be a tool that both you and IT want, like an EDR tool or some sort of like a jam for something, um, or cloud security tool when you're talking to your DevOps or ops team. These items might make more sense on their budget, but only if they agree. Don't steal people's budgets. Uh, you probably won't be able to get away with that anyway without maybe doing some phishing, getting their credentials. Uh, this works for a few reasons, potentially. One is that cloud spend is pretty elastic and it's almost always gonna be with an existing vendor like AWS or GCP. So while you shouldn't go hiding things in like some sort of slush fund, saying, oh, we're gonna add this specific spend to our AWS bill every month to pay for uh, increased logging of some kind or maybe guard duty, that's often a lot easier to stomach than asking for some specific third-party tool that's gonna to create a new vendor relationship and a contract. Uh, this is basically exactly what we did uh, in the, that I've done in the past is not hiding these projects, but including them in, in existing cloud spend with existing vendors. And for ops, it could also be a win, like implementing a SIM or some sort of logging solution can help them out even more than it helps you out. But bringing that uh, request together shows that it's like efficient use of budget. All right, this one's a bit counterintuitive, but shrinking to grow. I put this under borrow because you can, you're can you borrowing capacity from other teams. Again, don't dump work on other people. These are all need to be done ethically and empathetically, but sometimes it can be a win for both teams. Um, if you're a security engineering team and you've gotten saddled, or in my case, for some reason jumped on the hand grenade that is IT security, uh, consider not doing it anymore with the approval of the other team and your boss. And this was a huge net win for me personally. I'd spent probably a year trying to do IT security and it just didn't really make sense. It's not a strength for me and it uh, really would belong more in like the IT department. And it turns out IT didn't really wanna give it up either. So we just agreed that they would handle it. Everyone agreed to this and instead, a security team would just engage with IT on specific projects um, and with a monthly sync, one-on-one -on -one sync. But we no longer had to worry about not being successful at something like rolling out AV where we didn't have the background or the capability or access to the tools to do that kind of work. So to summarize this section, um, working with your existing coworkers and teams can really get you quite a bit of capacity. Consider sharing budget and headcount 
for tools or individuals, which can benefit multiple teams. And also grow the security capabilities in your IT, your ops, your engineering, or, or other teams. All right, so lastly, I wanted to touch on the most potentially exciting topic uh, of stealing. So one thing you can steal are disasters. Uh, whether they're happening at your own company, your competitors, your peers, never let a good crisis go to waste. Don't give in to FUD, but a little bit of FUD can be healthy. Uh, it can be extremely persuasive to show larger companies having these incidents. Um, we had a large competitor in our space that had some bad press and then actually uh, a breach. And showing that large companies with larger security teams than us in the same industry, the same type of data, could suffer these sort of attacks showed that we needed to invest more in security and that there was um, good reason to do so. So make sure these relevant uh, these stories are relevant to your company though. You don't wanna just like pull out Colonial Pipeline or that meatpacking uh, uh, plant story that happened recently and say, oh, this is why we need to invest. And they're gonna look at you and say, well, that's like a ransomware attack that doesn't really have anything to do with us. No, the more relevant, the better. Like, that's why the competitors is particularly useful. So other things to steal are information and strategies. Please steal this talk uh, by using the ideas in it. Conferences and meetups, peers on Twitter, buying people lunch. This is just good advice in general um, when it comes to growing your career, no matter the industry, but particularly in security. But when I went from being just an IC to someone who was in the process of growing and building a security team, this became completely invaluable to me. Um, and also I found, of course, people in security are very open to helping out peers and people more junior to them. So I got I had the opportunity to, to meet with CISOs and heads of security at very large companies and just talk to them and, and say, you know, at a high level, here's my situation. How have you successfully fought these battles in the past? How have you grown a security team um, effectively? How do you, you know, do mentorship effectively, work with engineering effectively. Uh, also, worst case, uh, if things get really bad at your current company, it might lead to job offers from those mentors down the road, so you can't hurt. Also, negotiation isn't really stealing, but I thought I'd put it in this section. There's lots of great resources on negotiation. I think most people probably have a favorite self-help book on the topic. Um, good places to practice, of course, are buying a car or selling something on Craigslist. But it's important to know you can always negotiate with software vendors. Don't settle for the list price. Uh, you should get competing quotes and you should be willing to walk away. This was also specific to my experiences at Favor, but when I joined, we'd actually been acquired already. And so we had a parent company that we could often get bundled pricing with. Your, this is less applicable to most startups, to a true startup for sure. but. I wanted to include it because it was really valuable for us. It's so also, this is one of those topics that their entire book's about, and I could definitely give a, an its own presentation on, but building versus buying. So all products have a build versus buy decision. Um, with security feature sets and tools, products, this is also relevant. So figuring out whether to do it yourself or steal by buying it from someone is an important decision. There's security implications as well, right? Like rolling your own off versus buying some sort of SaaS product like Cognito or Auth0. That, it, there's security pros and cons to those approaches. Um, but there's also decisions around cost and resource, uh, resources. MFA, for example, there are plenty of vendors who will pay, you can pay to handle MFA for you. Some of them though are basically just selling the ability to send emails with like a securely generated URL or token. You can definitely shoot yourself in the foot with that, but it's also the kind of work that at a certain scale can be worth doing yourself. So while this needs to be carefully done um, and the security implications have to be considered, doing something yourself can be a good use of your own time and budget. Also, this one's the most obvious use of steel, I think, finding coworkers who wanna join your team. Again, be careful. You can't just pull people off of their existing work uh, without approval from your boss, their boss. But this can be really great. And one of my most rewarding experiences in the journey of growing a security team from just myself into a few people was bringing someone from the QA team into security. So they're a pretty well-tenured QA professional. Uh, 
and at the company as well. So they were a huge resource to me. But I found that when I joined, they were starting to kind of handle some of those pen testing and security responsibilities because they found it really interesting. So I started out just informally mentoring them. But with approval, that turned into a split role where they spent half their time on QA and half on security. And while there were some bumpy parts of that journey, for sure, uh, it ended up working out and they ended up moving to security and sort of a lateral promotion to security engineer. So that was a huge win for that person's career and their life but also as a huge win for security because that early, we probably wouldn't have been able to get a job rec for someone with that sort of experience. And of course their knowledge of the company and quality assurance was really invaluable. So to summarize, uh, negotiate with your vendors and consider bringing coworkers from other parts of the company to security if you can figure out a good way to do so. So, uh, Summarize the whole presentation. Uh, I'd advocate for begging by building a risk assessment framework, tying your ass to your mitigations, borrowing by working with other teams, and stealing by finding opportunity to get headcount and budget where you can find it. Of course, I couldn't end my talk without plugging the fact that we are hiring. Um, we'll be opening some security job recs to, uh, soon, probably an application or cloud security. So if you're interested, please reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you about what our CISO and myself and the rest of our security team are doing and what we're hoping to do. And we're also hiring for operations and DevOps folks, SRE. So we could really uh, really value your um, applications there. If you'd like a referral, also feel free to reach out to me later or on Twitter. But at this point, I'd like to take any questions that y'all might have. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. Um, I'm not seeing any questions so far. I'll uh, give it a minute or two. I really appreciate yeah. you coming on and giving that presentation. It's been helpful for me a lot. Awesome. Yeah, you mentioned before that uh, this was a topic that was near and dear to your heart. Yeah, I'm often uh, uh, on a team of one or two engineers where we're building out the the security capabilities. So it's uh, it was real nice. Cool. Yeah, and I'll, of course, I'll be on the Discord later today or, or on Twitter if anyone wants to reach out. Be happy to talk to folks. My name is Christopher Hatnagy. I'm the CEO of Innocent Lies Foundation. The Innocent Lies Foundation is an organization that I started that is made up of security professionals that want to help save children from the horrors of child abuse. Hi, my name is Shane McCombs, and I am the Chief Operations Officer for the Innocent Lives Foundation. The vision of the ILF is to protect innocent children from anyone who supplies and trades in child abuse material. We use our skills to uncover and unmask those who try to anonymously hide online while spreading, producing, and profiting from child abuse material. We were able to collect security professionals from around the globe that are experts in their particular field. We have people that have mastered OSINT, or Open Source Intelligence Gathering. We have expert coders. We have expert exploit writers. We have people that have really mastered these areas of their field, and they have come to donate their time in order to help us unmask these anonymous child predators. But one of our core principles at the Innocent Lives Foundation is to never do anything illegal. The ILF is a non-vigilante organization. So we work within all of the laws that are appropriate. And in fact, one of the principles that we have internally is that we work hard to remain above reproach, meaning that obviously we're not going to cross the line, but ideally we don't even want to get close to the line. If there's a gray area, we do everything in our ability to be sure that we are not in the gray area and therefore staying above reproach because the goal is to get this guy off the street. And what good will it do for us to unmask someone for him to just be turned out loose later because we didn't follow the rules? If we were to perform one illegal act while catching a predator, law enforcement would not be able to use the information that we hand over, which would make all of that work useless and that person can walk free. Even worse than walking free, they now may be armed with information and become even a smarter predator. So as we do the work, we want to be able to give them a file. That file should contain the 10, 50, 100 steps that it took us 
to connect that online anonymous perpetrator with a real person. One of our core goals is to make sure that we produce a file that can walk any law enforcement agent through every step that we take legally so they come to the same conclusions that we do. Our main focus is being able to save law enforcement the hundreds of hours of time, all the time, effort, and energy that they would have had to put into that case in order to find that predator. When we do that, then we consider that a win and we consider that a case that we can hand over. So the ILF has a couple methods uh, where a case comes to our attention. First of all, we have a report a case button on our website. That section of the website can be used by law enforcement or even just by civilians that know of child abuse cases or child abuse material online. They can report it to us and then we will work that case or hand it over to the appropriate law enforcement agency. The second way that we hear about cases as many times law enforcement agencies will come to us. Within those leads, those are the ideal ones because we're able to lend and assist immediately upon request. Maybe a local law enforcement agency that doesn't have the budget for OSINT experts or doesn't have the online expertise that we have in-house. So they'll come to us and say, hey, we have this case, we're not a dead end, is there any way you can help us figure out X, Y, and Z. When we successfully get to work with a law enforcement agency, it makes us feel so good that we were able to help them accomplish their job. And from the work that we've done so far, we've gotten incredibly positive feedback from the law enforcement agencies that we've had a, a privilege of working with and helping them close those cases. But more often than not, uh, we are able to find leads by going out and looking on the internet, seeing people already doing horrible things to kids. Those people are in the public, and therefore they may become an appropriate lead. We have a group of our volunteers that actually spend time looking at different forms where people try to hide child abuse material. When our volunteers find people that are uploading child abuse material, we make that username a case. And then we'll assign one of our crew that will then start to OSINT or look online at that open source intelligence at that username and see if they can connect that to a real life person. Of course, all of this work, even with donated time, uh, costs some money. The servers that we run, the tools that we need, and the people that are running the Innocent Lives Foundation, we're able to accomplish all of that because of voluntary donations. Every cent that everyone donates goes directly back in to running the organization and being able to put predators behind bars while working closely with law enforcement to do so. Donations are used to meet the needs of the technology that is used on the hunt, but it's also used to help protect our volunteers psychologically, to be sure that they're getting the wellness treatment that they need to help them stay balanced and emotionally fit so they can continue to do this incredible work. We have done so much more because people have donated. Our very first year that we started ILF, uh, and we were so excited about this, we were able to close nine cases. That means that we had nine files that we were able to hand off to law enforcement where we were able to uncover and identify a child predator. The very next year, because of all the donations and all the support that we got from people like you, we were able to hand in over 75 cases that next year. The increase was mind-blowing, and that was because we were able to add more volunteers, more technology, more tools, and all of that added up into closing more cases to help save more kids. There's a tremendous number of organizations out there are doing phenomenal work. If you feel that our mission is in alignment with your core values, then we would love to have you donate to us. A study in 1995 tells us that one predator may affect the lives of up to 400 children. That means when the child predator you helped to unmask is a serial predator, you may be helping to protect up to 400 children.